this difficult to treat TB, I thought I would make it into a case-based discussion, something that we see routine, day in and day out, and something which we don't realize that how to manage these patients. And these slides, uh, I want to acknowledge and thank my team for helping me preparing these slides. They are my fellows in pediatric ID and clinical associate. So we start with this 10-year-old girl. Uh, she presented in March this year with low-grade fever, weight loss, and loss of appetite for a month. She went to a, another pediatrician, and uh, they did a lot of investigations, including a CT chest abdomen. And what did they find was they found uh, there were necrotic abdominal and mediastinal nodes. You can see the arrows already pointing it out, these necrotic nodes in the mediastinum and the abdomen. And there was circumferential thickening of the IC valve. So with a radiological suspicion of TB, they started the child on first line ATT. Uh, in that hospital, they didn't do a biopsy of those glands to get a microbiological diagnosis. They started her on HRZE in March. Now April, she always, uh, she had been on this ATT for a month and her fever continued. And now she started getting pain in the hip joint, right hip, which was radiating to the right thigh. So she was referred to us and we kept a diagnosis that probably this was disseminated TB with no microbiological evidence. And when she came to us, her weight and height were okay, but she had a gibbous in the lumbosacral region and she had a doughy feel of the abdomen. And if you see the investigations when she came to us, she had this lymphopenia that was not there earlier. Her ESR had started rising, her CRP had started rising, her uric acid was sky high. We did her gastric lavage, we also do a stool gene expert, which was both negative. Chest x-ray was normal. We did an ultrasound abdomen that showed omental caking now. And we did an MRI spine, and you can see there's multiple vertebral involvement including the femoral shaft. So we thought probably this is something sort of a malignancy with metastasis or probably this is drug resistant TB. So we went ahead and did an omental biopsy and this is the picture that the surgeon shared with us. You can see the omentum completely fly, uh, uh, you know, flooded with tubercular, tubercles and on table they told us this is TB. We did a gene expert on those omental biopsy and that showed MTB, which was not rifampicin resistant. So it was rifampicin sensitive, drug sensitive TB, and still the child was running fever, the child was deteriorating, in spite of being on the first line drugs. In fact, her six weeks TB culture also came negative. Now, for this present fever evaluation, the only thing that we had was a lymphopenia. Lymphopenia can also be seen with uh, TB, but it can be a lot of other things. And in Mumbai, we are having an undercurrent of COVID that is going on, which nobody is testing nowadays. But we see a lot of these post-COVID syndromes in children coming with varied presentations, especially ileocecal thickening is one of the features that they come, POs that they come. They don't come as MISC, but they come with these kind of GI manifestations. And the way that we detect them is by looking for POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So one of these unexplained fevers, and when you have lymphopenia, we check for their sleeping heart rate and then the standing heart rate. And if there's a jump, there's a jump by say 25 or 30 beats per minute, we know this is POTS and we highly suspect COVID, post-COVID. So here you have a uh, CRP which is high, a ferritin that's high, IL-6 that's high, and a COVID antibody 637. Now a lot of you all will tell me, oh, these COVID antibodies could be non-specific. But if you look at the titers in a child who's had COVID, you would get the titers disappearing by two years. When you get acute COVID, you would have a titer somewhere around 2000 plus. Within three months, the titers would come down to around 900. Within five months, they would come down to around this level. So probably this child had a COVID around five to six months back. Okay, so this and these are unvaccinated children. Children still don't have the vaccine. So these are unvaccinated children. So probably she had COVID at that time and now you're seeing something like a post-COVID syndrome. We did an XDR panel in her just to make sure there's no INH resistance or other drugs. So all the drugs are sensitive. Her uric acid was high. 
So we just removed the pyrazinamide and we started Oflox in her regimen. And we continued our INH rifampicin and clamidol. We also added allopurinol. And then subsequently her uric acid came down in a month's time. For this suspected post-COVID syndrome, we started her on prednisolone. We were very reluctant to start prednisolone, especially with the spine involvement. But then we said, this is the only way we'll be able to control it. And we tapered it also in a month's time. So it was not a standard two milligram per kg of prednisolone. We started with one and tapered it off, and her fever subsided. She was started on calcium, vitamin D, and analgesics. And within a week of starting this steroids, her fever subsided. Now in May, she comes. And she comes with a swelling in the right hand of the second metacarpal. She's again running fever for five days. And you find there is dactylitis. So TB dactylitis has now set in. Her ESR is now 84. We were suspecting some sort of an immunodeficiency in her. Why is she getting these recurrent newer bone lesions that are coming up? And we did her immunoassay. Her HIV was negative. Primary immunodeficiency workup also turned out to be negative. And again, she underwent curettage of that bone lesion. And we did an expert on it. And again, it was refer sensitive. So you have a refer sensitive TB, which is worsening over a period of time in spite of being on that AKT. Again, the culture from that side also did not grow any MTB. So my question to the audience, pre-lunch hypoglycemia, to wake you up is, what is the cause of this TB worsening? Could anybody in the audience? Okay. So something called as paradoxical reaction. So this is the MRI which showed that there was uh, dactylitis. And uh, we just continued this. Now the thing is, because we thought that this is paradoxical reaction, we added steroids in her and she improved. So you can see this TB dactylitis of this classical, which we hardly see nowadays. And uh, we added steroids here, again at 0.5 mg per kg per day. We didn't add it at 2 because we don't want the bone lesions to, you know, worsen. So just enough to control the fever and to control the inflammation. And in next 4 months, she had a weight gain of 2.5 kilos and she was fine. So what is this paradoxical reaction? What we call as IRIS, Immune Reconstitution Syndrome in HIV, is known as paradoxical reaction in TB. And it's basically, there's recovery of the immune system, but there's clinical and radiological worsening of TB while you're on treatment. And it's seen almost in six to 25% of patients. The common sites of paradoxical reactions are basically you'll get enlargement of the lymph nodes if it's cervical TB or mediastinal TB. You may get tuberculomas coming up on treatment. You may get serocytis, pleural effusion. Hardly you'll get bone involvement as a paradoxical reaction. Now what's the time to development of these paradoxical reactions? It's anywhere from 14 days to 270 days. So it's not necessary. It, it depends when the immune system is recovering. The time it starts recovering, you may get a paradoxical reaction. And the cause, what is postulated, is that there is heavy release of the tubercular protein following chemotherapy. There's a lot of cascade of cytokines along with TNF-alpha and that causes the severe tissue damage and that's the reason why you give these immunosuppressive drugs to control it. Always keep in mind before you say it's paradoxical reaction that this could be a secondary bacterial infection, this could be drug resistant TB or it could just be a poor compliance because the child is clinically worsening. But how do you differentiate well, in paradoxical reactions, your TB cultures are negative. So that is one way to differentiate. Drug resistance, your cultures would be positive. Compliance poor, cultures would still be positive. So this is one way to determine that your TB culture is negative. How do you treat these? Well, mild paradoxical reactions, some abscess developing here while you're treating, doesn't require anything, you just continue the AKT. But if there are large paradoxical reactions, like say hydrocephalus developing or a massive pleural effusion or deep-seated abscesses, you may need to even go for surgical treatment. I remember a child who on treatment used to develop paraparyngeal abscess and she needed drainage of these abscesses three or four times before she recovered. 
for severe paradoxical reactions you may give corticosteroids you may even give infliximab or you may even give tnf alpha antagonist like thalidomide so this was our paper on paradoxical reactions which we had published and we checked for paradoxical reaction in 1000 children with tb retrospectively and we found that the incidence was 3.3% Mediastinal nodes, tuberculomas, increase in size of nodes, serocytis were the most common presentations of these paradoxical reactions. So this was the first case that you, I wanted to discuss with you that not all worsening TB is drug resistant TB. Keep in mind paradoxical reaction. Now the other unusual things that we see is BCG adenitis. All of us know that BCG adenitis if it's small in size and non-fluctuant, you don't really need to do anything, just observe. But if the swelling has become fluctuant, then you drain the abscess. Don't do incision and drainage, just do aspiration and drainage. You don't need to give anti-tuberculous therapy. If it refills again, you keep on doing repeated drainage, but no need for anti-tuberculous therapy. So when would you give ATT in these patients? Where you've done excision, and in spite of that, the gland has remained behind or pus has refilled again. That's the time you'll consider ATT in these patients. Again, BCG adenitis, remember, it's uh, BCG is resistant to pyrazinamide. So when you give treatment for BCG adenitis, you don't add pyrazinamide in the therapy. Now you have BCG adenitis can come up to even two years, three years post BCG. So it's not necessary. It's going to develop immediately. Now this you have a 7 month old female child, she has swelling over the left axilla for a month. Pediatric surgeon has done aspiration and drainage twice but the swelling recurred. And then she's referred to us, she has a BCG scar on the left upper arm and there is a 5 by 5 centimeter swelling with pus pointing. Again drainage of the pus is done, this time we send an expert and MTB detected. We didn't start AKT, the child's lesions improved. The culture after three weeks grew MTB complex. So this is the DST pattern. You see sensitivity to all the drugs including pyrazinamide. Now as I told you earlier, BCG is resistant to pyrazinamide. So the question here is, is this BCG or is this MTB infection? Anyone from the audience? Okay, so we don't know what's happening, but because pyrazinamide is sensitive, it could be MTB because you have to make a decision whether to start anti-TB treatment or not to start. So we went ahead and did a 16S RNA sequencing. Now what is the 16S? It's a ribosomal uh, PCR. So we do a ribosomal PCR depending on the species and you can identify the species that is there. That's, this is for any bacterial infection. Most of these uh, 16S RNA PCRs are available in research labs. So if you can get your research lab to do it, they'll do it. And here we found an MTB L1 strain, which was suggestive that this is MTB and not BCG. And then this child was started on 4-drug AKT and then it was stopped. So there was this paper uh, which has found that in Oman, this is an Oman strain and uh, this is the commonest strain in the Middle East also. Now the question is, does expert MTB pick up BCG? Yes. So don't forget that BCG may be picked up by your expert. So a lot of times you do BCG adenitis, drainage, expert comes positive, you start treatment. Don't. Because it will pick up all these MTB uh, complex which also includes your mycobacterium bovis and your BCG. So that is one thing that you remember. So the conclusion here is not all left armpit swellings are BCG. Expert can also detect BCG and M. bovis and treatment will depend on the strain of mycobacterium that you are isolating. So I think I was pretty, that was a pretty confusing case and uh, let's go to even more confusing one. So we have a patient with different resistance pattern in the same patient. So you have a 12 year old female, she has nephrotic syndrome for a year, vomiting for 5 days, right upper limb monoparesis for one day, difficulty in speech for one day. So some sort of a hemiplegia that she's come with. You do an MRI brain, she's got infarcts, but she also has this tuberculoma sitting there. A CSF is done, which is almost bang normal. 
So CSF has not picked up anything. So there's a vasculitis and there's tuberculoma. And CSF gene expert ultra also did not pick up MTB. Now in HRCT, because she had a pulmonary TB simultaneously, and it shows a lot of consolidation with mediastinal nodes. A bowel is done and that shows rib sensitive MTB. Now she started on first line anti-TB treatment. Six weeks later, the CSF culture grew MTB and a line probe assay on the CSF shows a pre-XDR. So your bowel has shown rifampicin sensitive and your CSF has shown a pre-XDR which is resistance to rifampicin, isoniazide, fluoroquinolones and PZA. The question is how do you treat this patient? Do you continue first line or do you start second line, stop the first line? So how do you treat this patient? Anybody in the audience? You will see this very often now because we have been seeing this quite often and this is something known as a mixed TB infection. So it's not that the reports are wrong. The same patient will be harboring two strains of MTB and this is very common in areas that are hyperendemic for TB. Say for example, Mumbai is the hotbed of TB. So that's a hyperendemic area. And it's because either you're exposed to multiple strains or the bacillus mutates. And this is known as heteroresistance. And the incidence is almost from 2.8% to 21.1%. That's why a lot of times you have a rif sensitive TB, you've started first line and then you find, oh, it's not responding. Why is the culture still coming positive? Maybe it's a heteroresistant strain that you have. How do you treat this? What happens is, if you treat with first line, the MDR strains will worsen. If you treat with second line, the drug susceptible strains will still be there. So your second line doesn't work very well for the drug sensitive TB. So that is one thing that you need to remember, that you may have to actually give both. And that's what we'll end up doing for our patients. We'll end up treating as per the sensitivity report and we treat both. So you may stop the first line in say six months, but you will continue the second line for 18 months. So you treat both the infections. You treat this as two infections and treat the patient. So here we continued first line isoniazide rifampicin. We added second lines consisting of PAS, clofazamine, bedaquiline and delaminate. So we gave a combination therapy here. So I would like to end this talk by saying that TB diagnosis and treatment is evolving. It's not so simple any longer that you just give six months therapy and that's the end of the story. And disease progression is quite variable on treatment. So you need to keep a close watch. We are heading towards TB elimination. The government of India has kept 2025 as the target, which is very difficult to achieve. WHO wants to eliminate TB by the year 2030 and we are still far, far away. So just keep all these clinical scenarios in mind which may help you in your clinical practice. Thank you very much.